What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast brought to you by Keeping Carlson. I'm your co-host, Louis Ezekiel, and joining me tonight, my pal and yours, Jeremy Vrissillo. Jeremy, how are you doing this fine Tuesday evening? Doing pretty well. This is the stressful time of the fantasy season. I'm not thrilled about how some of my teams are looking, and well, it may be over. It's come next week. Yeah, it's a it's a tough period for sure. Uh, I'm up against the top team in my league, and I feel like every win is a every week is a must win. And I don't have any of my good players playing until tomorrow, so I'm stressing a little bit here. But I'm trying to tell myself, you know, the hole that I'm in is not insurmountable. I just got to kind of hang in there a little bit. But I do think I might uh, hold off on using any additional moves because if things get really bleak, I want to use them for. Uh, I want to use them for the end of the week here, but I think there's six teams tied at nine and 11, all in that seventh slot. And you need to be in the top six to make the playoffs. So it is really crunch time in my cupful division. Absolutely. Uh, if you are here for the first time, and if so, uh, awesome, but uh, a little surprised, I suppose. But Short Shift is the twice weekly check in between the ginormous Sunday evening mega shows of Keeping Carlson, designed to keep you up to date with fantasy news, takes, and analysis all throughout the fantasy season. Uh, and I actually want to start with a special shout out today. Uh, I wanted to shout out to the Saginaw Junior Spirit 10 and under hockey team, the runners up in the Michigan State Tournament last weekend, uh, and especially Ronan Smithwick, uh, family friend. He opened and closed the scoring uh, in a 5 4 thriller that we attended on Saturday. So, way to go, Ronan and the Spirit. Uh, awesome job, and uh, can't wait to see you up at the lake this summer. All right, well, let's jump right into the headlines here. And uh, I think you summed up our first point very good. Uh, it just says Alex Nylander and a bunch of question marks and exclamation points. Yeah, uh, trivia for those of you listening to this show. Which team does Alex Nylander play for? I bet a lot of people don't know that, even though I think we briefly mentioned it a few shows ago. He got traded from Pittsburgh to Columbus and is suddenly on fire. He has four goals and two assists in th the last three games. He's got six points and 15 shots on goal and five total. He's getting what's equivalent to power play one deployment. He's seeing 19 or 20 minutes a night. Although his line mates are Alexander Texier and Cole Sillinger, which is, in my opinion, kind of a third line on that Columbus team. I think your summary in the uh, chat had it pretty good that I don't necessarily believe this it's a nice 40 percent shooting bender he had a hat trick that included an empty netter and at even strength they're almost doubling their expected goals for i'm not buying it in like a cup full size leagues 14 teamers maybe for back-to-back -back games like we had monday tuesday this week i'm very disappointed i did not have him on my roster last night even though he was never in consideration yeah it's an interesting hot streak from a guy with a recognizable name, but I have a hard time buying in even on the new team. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I do like that he's getting, uh, you know, majority power play time overall uh, over these last three games. Um, you know, that that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening when that line is on the ice over the course of their 35 minutes together prior to Tuesday night's game. Uh, in 35 minutes, they had scored six times uh, and allowed three goals against. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's quite a bit of scoring that's happening when they're out there in the ice in that combination, but yeah, uh, you know, exciting. I don't think anybody had him necessarily, you know, I, I can't imagine too many teams had him for that hat trick. Um, but I wouldn't be running out to grab him either. I think he did pick up an assist against the Penguins in their five, three loss on Tuesday. Um, but yeah, overall, um, great for him. Glad he's finding success. You know, he, uh, had some very sporadic games with the Penguins, uh, just, you know, throughout the, the months leading up to the trade. And he seems to have found a spot where he's uh, a little more comfortable there. Um, next up, we got to talk about, uh, the New Jersey Devils. Uh, Lindy Ruff was fired and replaced with Travis Green, uh, who now has coached, as, as people were mentioning on Twitter, now has coached all of the Hughes brothers. Uh, so nice for him and, uh, you know, getting the chance to play with a, with a really competent duo over in New Jersey. Uh, the first kind of big move was uh, Green had a talk with uh, Simone Nemec, and uh, he kind of, he was benched for uh, some issues in his game that uh, Green had been observing recently. 
uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into any big ideas about what exactly this means for the future. It looks like they are, uh, likely to finish up losing four to three, uh, to the Panthers here this evening. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what to expect looking forward. I'm not a, an expert on coaches, um, but you know we may see some people moving up and down the lineup. Certainly, I think what New Jersey needs is a couple things. They need a goalie to make a save for them. Uh, we've seen bad goaltending doom, many a coach. Uh, but also, I think just generally the Devils have not been um, doing a great job of uh, creating high-quality chances. I recall that game against the Kings. Um, where the spray chart was like there was a big, you know, white gap up the middle of the ice and everything was coming for the outside and, and Talbot was uh, able to make some really easy saves in there. So, you know, th- those are the things that I would look for, um, you know, for Green to kind of emphasize might be uh, pushing to get the, the puck towards the middle of the net, create some traffic, create some havoc, try to get some lucky bounces, but do a little bit more from the middle of the ice. Uh, and then maybe if they can find a way to support the goaltending. The goaltending is going to be key. They got uh, another four goals scored on Akira Schmid today. So none of their goaltending is working. They're basically out of the playoff hunt at this point, it seems, especially if they are getting terrible goaltending. So I don't even know if they're going to trade for one. As far as the forward lines go, nothing got shuffled up there in the top two lines, as far as I can tell. The only change from pre-green was that Andre Palat was hurt, which we have in our injury section, but I'll just drag up now. So Chris Tierney stepped into the third line. Seems like he's not throwing everything into a blender to start. And then, we, as you mentioned, Simon Nemec is sitting today, but he will definitely be going back in, according to the tweet I saw. Yeah, and that actually is a nice segue into another guy uh, who is being benched but is going to get back in for the next game, uh, and that was uh, Marchenko uh, was scratched, a healthy scratch for the Blue Jackets uh, in that game against the um, uh, Penguins. I believe he was replaced by Andrew Peak, uh, who uh, played pretty well, got some points. I don't remember exactly what variety, um, but I remember seeing him come across on the scoreboard uh, much to my dismay since I'm playing Tristan Jari, although he got the win in the end there. So uh, that's not so bad. But um, they also said, you know, he's going to be back in for the next game. So a temporary bump, an unfortunate uh, moment for those uh, owners. Maybe they had a full roster tonight, although it's not the busiest of two Tuesdays uh, and was able to get him back in. But, you know, you can take John Tortorella out of Columbus, but you can't always take the uh, – wait, what is it? <laughs> That's no good. Uh, yeah, anyway, you can take him out of Columbus, but you can't take him out of the team necessarily. So that that accountability bit there, uh, you know, I think I appreciate it. Um, hopefully it works. You know, it's coaching tricks of the trade, right, to try to light a fire under these guys and get them some motivation. So uh, maybe he'll come out and have a big game uh, when the Blue Jackets next hit the ice. Yeah, in case you right. didn't catch that, he was replaced by Andrew Peake, who's a defenseman. So the Blue Jackets were rolling 11 forwards today. Peake did have a goal and a shorthanded assist in 14 minutes, but not particularly relevant. Yeah, I mean, obviously the points are great, but yeah, you don't want to be rostering a defenseman that's getting that few of minutes. Uh, absolutely. Um, we got some trade talks, some of the real variety, some of the potential variety, like the, the cautiously holding players out season has begun, which is always kind of a bummer when it hits your roster as well. Uh, it takes through a couple of these, uh, these guys who are being held out for the possibility of a move. The two that are officially being held out explicitly for trade related reasons are Alex Wenberg in Seattle and Jason Zucker in Arizona. I think if you're holding either of those guys, you can drop them ahead of the trade deadline. Most of the time when good players on bad teams get traded, it's to be a depth role on a better team. So I don't expect Wenberg will be playing on the power play when he gets traded, like he is in Seattle, is one example. And, you know, just keep an eye on it, see where they go. I expect both of them will move if they've been held out. Another guy who actually did get traded, Anthony Mantha got traded from the Capitals to the Golden Knights. And those sneaky Golden Knights got 50% retained, so they may not be done. I know the rumor all along is they wanted two wingers, maybe one of them being Jake Gensel. And 
They saved enough cap space with the Mark Stone LTIR move and the retention on this that, you know, maybe they'll do something else. What do you think of Mantha in Vegas this year? So Mantha kind of maybe played his way into this trade a little bit. He's having his best season since he left the Red Wings. Um, The one thing I worry about is that there's probably at least four, if not five or six guys ahead of him for power play time. I think he could be a power play two guy. Um, You know, I think if you liked Mantha in Washington, you might like him in Vegas. Um, I remember uh, Dabber mentioned uh, Vegas is a a better place to pick up some hits, uh, potentially, with the way they do their scorekeeping. So he said that could be a potential benefit. That's such a great insight. Uh, I always like that kind of uh, marginal stuff there. But, you know, I think it is maybe a slight downgrade for Mantha. Like you said, a lot of times when these players are being traded, it's so that they can become this depth piece. Um, You know, I think he can definitely be, uh, you know, a, a... quality player for them, but I don't think he's going to be anything more than he was in Washington, and he may be a little bit less. But, you know, he does have, I believe, 20 goals on the season. So, you know, he's been a pretty decent scorer, shot taker. Um, And, yeah, like you know, like I said, I think if you liked him in Washington, you might like him in Vegas, Uh, maybe not quite as much. I'm kind of interested in him, maybe not as an immediate ad, but definitely a watch list guy. Because Vegas' second-line wingers currently are Michael Amadio, who's done well in the role, and Chandler Stevenson, who usually plays center, and I think they probably would rather play center. So all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, maybe he is second-line, second power play. I think he has a similar skill set and play style to Barbashev, who fit right in last year. And Vegas seems to have been pretty good in the past about everybody has a role and everybody can fit in. So if the opportunity arises to stream a player from Vegas anytime soon, I'll be looking at Mantha pretty quickly, maybe even before Stevenson and Carlson, just for the hits and shots aspect of his game. Hmm. All right, I'll disagree with you a little bit there. Give me William Carlson. Maybe it's some recency bias because I was up against him, but he, uh, I would rather, I'd rather have the guy who's been on the team for a while and knows... Uh, knows what he wants to do um, maybe more than the new guy, but you might, uh, you might be right. Maybe he's going to come in with some fire and, and really uh, get things started uh, early on. Uh, the other big piece, obviously, and, and we don't have any real news to report on this yet, but uh, Jake Gensel, uh word on the street is he's expected to be moved by Wednesday. So obviously keep an eye out there. As you said, um, you know, A lot of times you worry about a bit of a downgrade. I wonder just because, you know, it doesn't get a whole lot better than playing with Sidney Crosby. Um, But, you know, it could be an opportunity if he can get himself onto, you know, a more lethal power play uh, than what the Pens have been able to put together so far this season. Uh, It could be a potential for an upgrade in that department. But um, the likelihood that he's going to have a better even strength deployment, I think, is is pretty slim. So it might be a six one half dozen the other kind of side grade for him, I would imagine. Uh, we're going to jump into a quick ad break here. We will see you on the other side. You're listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back to Short Shifts. Jeremy, we have a whole bunch of injuries and outries that we've got to discuss. Let's start with the big injury here. Terrible news for the Red Wings. Uh, Dylan Larkin is going to be out for a couple weeks here. Tough timing as the Wings are fighting to secure a spot in the playoffs for the first time in quite a while. Uh, The immediate effects are we see Robbie Fabry move up to the first power play. Uh, Joe Valeno is centering Kane and Debrinkit. Um, We always used to debate on the show, Ben and I, about uh, if you want the power play one guy or the line one guy at even strength. Um, I do like Valeno here, I think, as the guy with the best improvement of deployment. Um, Obviously, playing with Kane and Dabrinkit, you know, the way that they have uh, brought it the last uh, last few weeks, I think that is the spot to be in. So uh, if adding a Red Wing to your lineup is beneficial to you uh, and you're looking for a guy to add, I would uh, have Valeno be my first option. And then uh, Fabry is a nice option if you're looking to get in on that power play a little bit. I agree with you. I think I'd Rather Valeno, I think from the eye test, he's looked a bit better the past few weeks. Both of them are about half point per game players over the course of the season and recently. I do think this is a bit of a downgrade for the rest of Detroit, though. 
which is unfortunate timing, trying to make playoffs here, kind of hurts to lose your best player and your best distributor. Well, maybe Patrick Kane's the best distributor. Uh, they're going to score less goals over the next six games or whatever. Yeah, and I think when you're talking about scoring fewer goals, that's a little scary given what uh, given what the goalies have been giving up. Speaking of, um, Avili Huso remains uh, week to week. So uh, if you got your Alex Lyon, uh, hopefully he can uh, you know hold up the back end for the Red Wings, uh, at least from my position as a Wings fan. I know other people would prefer to maybe leapfrog them into that playoff position, but uh, yeah, I think he's going to really be leaned on a little bit of James Reimer here and there. But uh, yeah, I think it's mostly going to be Lions show here moving forward. Uh, all right. So uh, we had some discussion in the short shifts channel uh, about this injury that's next up and whether we should go and grab uh, some of those backups. And actually one of them scored here today. Uh, Vince Dunn was injured um, by one of, and I'm never going to pronounce this names right. Help me out. Martin in, in Calgary. Martin Pospisil, uh, also known as also known as Popsicle, is what I've seen him called on internet boards. So oh, I'll go. That makes way more sense. That's what I should have gone with. <laughs> yeah. So it was honestly a pretty dirty hit. Like lined him up two feet away from the boards, head first in. I think he probably expected Dunn to turn and take the hit instead of continuing to shield the puck. But he's got himself a hearing for it. I suspect he'll get suspended for a few games, and Dunn may be out couple weeks to be honest looking at how that injury happened i shouldn't speculate though head injuries and stuff like that are so finicky Uh, i I actually must have missed the discussion you guys had on who to replace him with i'm assuming the question is justin schultz versus uh riker evans yeah so um it was uh, uh derek brought up justin schultz uh and considering Larson as well. Schultz had a goal here uh, on Tuesday. So uh, that would have obviously been a nice choice. Um, You know, speaking of popsicle here, (laughs) you were, you were uh, another thing that we saw in the chat was you were trying to have us guess who is this player who's getting seven, eight, nine hits a game, I guess, sooner or later. uh, One of those is going to be one of the dirtier variety and it's going to get you in some trouble. But um, when he gets back, you might think about if you are in a, uh, categories league, and you're looking for hits. I don't know that anybody has been hitting the way uh, that Martin Pospisil. Oh, man. This is my worst pronunciation of the day. I should be looking at the word. Anyway, uh, I don't think anybody's been hitting like Popsicle, uh, even if he may sound like a supplement that you take for your, you know, Giardia. Uh, uh, he's hitting everybody in sight right now. Uh, let's move on and talk about Gabe Velarde. Uh, Gabe Pilardi remains out, but he is traveling with the team. Uh, so that seems to indicate that we may see him back on that top line before too long. Uh, obviously be good, I think, for him, good for the team uh, to get back in there. He's been having uh, quite a bit of uh, success in that deployment. Anything you want to add about Velarde? I just hope he's back for next week where the Jets have a great Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday schedule. Uh, that's a lot more important than the two additional games they have this week. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, a couple more to get through. Uh, we've got Elvis Mers Lickens is day-to-day, just an illness, so hopefully he'll be back on his feet soon. Um, but meanwhile, we've gotten some nice outchery news. We'll start with the guys who are back for real. Those are Clayton Keller uh, back and playing for Arizona tonight. And Jack Eichel making his return. Got to imagine that those guys are uh, pretty widely owned. Um, so not a whole lot of actionable information there. But um, you know, starting your goalies against uh, Arizona might not necessarily be the slam dunk that it's been at times uh, for teams not named Ottawa uh, with Keller back. So that's obviously good news. And then hopefully Eichel can give some spark to that. Um, some additional spark, I should say, to that Vegas offense because defensively they've been really rough. I know that uh, Hill and Thompson owners have just been uh, riding the struggle bus pretty aggressively. Um, so there's one to keep an eye out for. Uh, and the Jeremy, we've got four guys who are probably on their way back, one maybe as soon as tomorrow. Uh, run us through the list of our other interesting fellows who are making their way back. Larry Nachushkin is practicing with a line, the second line. 
And I believe he was on power play one, at least last week. Uh, Haven't seen anything specific to today. He's the one who should be back tomorrow. He does technically have to get cleared by the league, but it doesn't sound like there's any obstacle there. And then the other three guys, these are more, they're skating, not, not likely to return soon. Sagan, Oshi, and Zegras were all skating before practice, meaning not with other players. That probably puts each of them at least a week, maybe as long as a month away. But Sagan and Oshi especially have good playoff schedules. So if you have a free move and a free IR spot, good idea to add them now if they're available. And I think, too, with uh, with Mantha out of the picture, I think Oshi's pretty guaranteed to, to be getting high-quality deployment the whole rest of the season here, uh, regardless of what other kind of shakeups that they make. So power play one and either line one or line two, you would have to imagine. All right, uh, let's jump into our hot and cold streaks to wrap up the show. Uh, and let's start with a hot streak from Justice Anunen. Two straight shutouts. Uh, started alternating games. Um, you have every word for Georgiev. I, I think this is an interesting one. So I picked up Justice for the start against Chicago, 37 save shutout. Uh, again, not a ton, kind of like the Talbot game we referenced earlier, not a ton of high danger opportunities uh, necessarily. And uh, Colorado was pretty comfortably in control the whole game. Um, but both of those shutouts were against Chicago, I believe an identical five to nothing victories. So that's great. Like, yes, good. You want him to, to you know, stop the other the other team. But Chicago's maybe not the greatest example. Uh, I think it would be nice to see him do it against somebody who, uh, you know, with a bit more of a pulse there, I suppose. But what are your thoughts on this? You know, uh, I'm going to turn the question back on you. Uh, are you worried about uh, Georgiev moving forward? Not particularly. I don't think this is going to turn into a full-on 50-50. And even if it does, Georgiev actually is tied for the league lead in wins, which is a good thing for fantasy. I think he'll still have plenty of value then. I'm torn on whether or not I'd continue holding Anunin. Like, I probably wouldn't, but I know some people I've been talking to are planning on it, at least hoping he gets Friday's game this week. Yeah, and you know, if if he is a guy that you can afford to hang on to and see if he gets one of these games later in the week, um, they do have a back-to-back on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week at Calgary and at Vancouver. Uh, So he might have the opportunity to jump in there. So if you think you can get one of those starts late in the week and then hang on to him into next week uh, to get another start, um, you imagine he would probably only start one of the three available games for next week. Uh, The Avalanche play Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Um, But that just might be a nice uh, strategic move for you if you've got faith in justice and feel that justice will prevail. Uh, This could be a good chance for you. Uh, to maybe sneak a couple games in here if he does get one of these games later in the week. Uh, Another pair that we have referenced, Aiden Hill and Logan Thompson, uh, running cold right now. Uh, Just has been a rough run for both of them. Um, You know, uh, some folks who were watching some of the game yesterday just saying that, you know, some of these goals against were, if not lazy, just kind of... uh, I don't know, unfortunate, like they're the kind of saves that you would prefer to have your goalie make. Um, Any thoughts on what you would want to do with these guys? We've talked in the past about how it can sometimes be tough in a league like the Cupful to roster uh, a goalie who is splitting starts. Uh, How would you approach dealing with these guys uh, at the moment? I'm actually still not convinced they're splitting starts. Aiden Hill looks like he started... Five of the last seven. Uh, We'll see what happens Wednesday or Thursday when they play next, even though he had a stinker last time. I would be holding Hill and probably cutting Thompson at this point. Uh, Just to put some numbers behind it, Hill has given up a save percentage less than 900 in six of the last seven starts he's had. And Logan Thompson has a at least four goals against in four of his last five appearances. So uh, four of his last six appearances, that is. And the goals saved above expected numbers aren't great either. I actually think a lot of it can be put on. These two goaltenders are not holding up their end of the bargain. 
which is interesting because Vegas is all of a sudden kind of losing their grasp on a playoff slot. They're uh, tied with LA and one point ahead of Nashville, which Nashville's kind of like the bar where Calgary and Seattle and St. Louis are a few points back and trying to catch them. But if anyone gets caught, if anyone goes cold, they could get caught here. And it's kind of crazy to be talking about Vegas as, you know, falling into the wild card conversation as opposed to the division winner conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just something odd that I noticed that I think is really interesting. Uh, Hill's last two starts were both really bad starts, meaning uh, less than 850 save percentage. It wasn't a whole lot less. Eight for identical 844 save percentages. Uh, that's because in both games, one against Boston and one against Columbus, he gave up five goals on uh, 32 shots. Uh, nearly identical goals against average because he played only 14 seconds difference, but the goals saved above average was also identical. So it means that the shots collectively were coming from uh, the you know right spots on the ice were allowing five. Uh, you know he allowed five where he should have allowed about three. Uh, just really interesting to see how uh, identical those numbers were in those two starts, despite two wildly different opponents there. And additionally, I watched uh, the last Vegas game and at least one of the shots was like top of the circle. He was fully set and it just beat him. No screen, no moving side to side. That's a goal that most goalies have, you know, 98, 99% of the time to see the puck and not be moving when it gets shot. Yeah, that's a tough one for sure. All right. Uh, one more hot and one more cold streak before we go. And our hot streak, uh, the rich just keep getting richer here. We wanted to talk about Jared McCann. Uh, 13 points in his last 10 games, 26 points in his last 20, 60 shots in that span. So he's only shooting 20%. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say only shooting 20%, but uh, you know, shooting 20% is not you know unfathomable uh, for a guy like McCann. Um, so, you know, he is playing well, uh, I believe a goal and an assist here tonight against me, unfortunately, uh, in my matchup against this top team in the division. So, uh, he didn't get there by mistake. It doesn't look like, um, but yeah, so really nice for Jared McCann. Obviously, uh, McCann is pretty widely, uh, owned across Yahoo. Um, but you know, definitely a guy that should be, uh, starting when you have the opportunity, um, yeah, and just fill in the fill in the stat sheet here. Uh, a goal, an assist, uh, a shorthanded point, three shots, two hits, uh, all the kind of stuff that you just love to see. Um, so good on you, Jared McCann. Keep up the good work. Uh, I wish you were doing it against somebody else, but I'll high five you when you're playing well. Uh, and then take us. This is a, a rather concerning one here, um, with no points in the last five games. Who do we have here? Uh, stinking up our end of our cold streaks. Mika Zibanejad doesn't have a point in his last five games and only has eight shots over that period to go with five hits and six blocks. That's a real frustrating turn of events for Mika owners, especially since he's barely had any games to play over the last two weeks. Let's hope he gets his game back for the Rangers five game week coming up next week so that owners can reap the benefits of, you know, five or six fantasy points per game. And all of a sudden it's a 30 point week. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, we talked earlier about, um, you know, some of the problems that John Tavares was going through, uh, you know, having a bit of a, of a struggle himself and he's gotten right a bit, you know, he's been, I think he has goals in two straight and taking lots of shots and getting some hits in there too. Um, so kind of turned it back to November to Varis. But I guess sort of the takeaway when we were talking about him was it can't really get worse for him in terms of his deployment and his production. I think that's true for Zibanejad too. His deployment's not going anywhere. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to play uh, any worse than he's currently doing. So hopefully uh, we'll see that kind of uh, step up in the right direction here, uh, like we saw with Johnny T in the very near future. And like you said, next week with that big upcoming schedule, I think is a, a great time for him to um, a great time for him to try to show that off. All right. Well, Jeremy, we have hit the end of another show. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to get to hang out and chat with you. Uh, a ton of content here on the keeping Carlson uh, channel uh, feed. 
we've got a patron cast that's going to come down uh, from this evening. So if you are a patron and you're signed up to receive those patron casts, uh, Brian and Elon are going to cover every question that comes up during the patron cast. They always do. Always a really fun kind of uh, more informal discussion in there. Uh, so keep an eye out for that if you are a patron. Um, if you're not a patron, think about joining up. Um, before too long, we'll be into that dollar a month uh, summer phase. So uh, not that it feels like summer quite yet. Uh, you can give us a follow at Short Shifts KK. Brian and Elon are at Keeping Carlson. Please use GameDayTweets.com to get all the best info from Twitter without having to slog through the rest of that hellscape. Uh, team by team searches, searchable tweets by player name, goalie news and predictions, all that kind of stuff. Um, please visit the that site and the other great sites we use to research our episodes at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, and Natural Stat Trick. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach. And until we see you next time, play smart and keep your shifts short.